All right, well, we will um, try to get underway here. Um, I'm expecting a few additional people to join us. And our panelist for the first panel with the Commerce Department will be arriving at about 2.15. Uh, but let's try to get underway. Welcome to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce webcast. Thank you for joining us. And to those in the room, good afternoon. And those who are watching from different time zones, good morning or good evening, or thank you for staying up late. My name is John Goyer, and I'm the Senior Director for Southeast Asia here at the Chamber. On behalf of the Chamber, I want to thank our guest of honor, Ucho Ho, as well as our friends in the U.S. government and our colleagues in the business community and other stakeholders that are here. I want to recognize my good friend, Dr. Mang Mang Lei, uh, representing the uh, Union of Myanmar Federation of Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Thank you also for being with us. The Chamber and the U.S. business community broadly have advocated for the normalization of the U.S.-Myanmar relationship for a number of years now. We see great potential in Myanmar, and we want to work with both the U.S. and Myanmar governments, as well as our counterparts in the Myanmar private sector, to realize that potential and support the country's transformation. And we think that U.S. business can play an important role in that transformation. There certainly are opportunities in that market, and our panelists today will talk about those. But there are also significant obstacles to greater investment, both on the Myanmar and on the U.S. side, and our panelists today will discuss those as well. While the U.S. has eased some sanctions in recent years, some important ones remain and, in our view, are a deterrent to greater investment by U.S. companies. While there has certainly been some investment and some successes, which we'll hear about today, we simply do not envision large-scale investment coming into the country while it remains under sanctions. And so for that reason, the U.S. Chamber and a number of other business groups have been engaging uh, vigorously with the administration and the Congress, and we recently uh, wrote to both to ask for the uh, lifting of sanctions. So sanctions are one set of challenges, but there are others, including a wide range of areas in Myanmar where internal reform will be needed. And these range from financial sector reform to the development of infrastructure to fundamental issues of rule of law, to name just a few. So between those sets of challenges, our concern is that Myanmar is missing out on U.S. investment. U.S. investment in ASEAN, of which Myanmar is a member, is huge, $226 billion at last count. But the amount of that that's parked in Myanmar right now is less than 1%, less than one-tenth of 1%. If you want to get a sense of the contrast, take a look at Myanmar's next door neighbor, Thailand. U.S. companies in Thailand are invested in the full range of manufacturing and service industries. They generate $22 billion annually in exports for Thailand. They employ 175,000 Thai workers directly with downstream positive impact on employment. And salaries of those directly employed are $3.2 billion a year. We share Myanmar's goal of bringing in more of that kind of investment, and we look forward to discussing today how we might do so. We will follow up on today's conference with an event in Yangon on June 6, at which we will be releasing a series of recommendations for attracting greater investment, boosting economic growth, and more fully normalizing the relationship. After remarks by our keynote speaker, Ucha Ho, our first panel will include our U.S. government colleagues, um, <clears throat> whom I will introduce after our guest speaker. The government panel will be followed uh, by a panel of business experts who will speak from experience to the challenges and the opportunities for U.S. investors in Myanmar. With that, I will turn it over to Eric Rose to introduce our keynote speaker. Eric is with the law firm of Hertzfeld Rubin, Meyer and Rose, the first American law firm to be admitted into Myanmar, and he's had an affiliation with the country for a number of years. Eric will also translate as our guest speaker, will speak in the Myanmar language. Thank you. Thank you, John, and um, good afternoon, morning, middle of the night in Myanmar, Mingalabakamia. Uh, Ujo Ho, uh, who leads uh, our uh, government affairs um, 
practice as well as our litigation uh, practice, um, has been a member of the National League for Democracy since 1990, after having been jailed for a year and a half for simply opposing the Nguyen government in 1988. Um, subsequently, he was arrested and jailed another six times. Um, eventually, he moved to Yangon, and um, he has represented Duan San Suu Kyi and uh, Wu Nian Win, the Secretary General of the NLD, as well as countless uh, numbers of um, people who have been, uh, in many cases, if not all cases, uh, wrongfully accused. Um, just to give you an idea of how hard he has been working in 2013 alone, he has put in over 1,500 hours uh, of, of pro bono work for the NLD, um, which is rather remarkable uh, in and of itself. In addition to that, while during the dictatorship, with the help of the British Council, he wrote booklets which give instructions on how to deal with the police, how to deal with the courts, how to uh, be able to deal with the government in a, in a country where, at the time, the rule of law was not exactly um, front and center. Um, he has represented, uh, as an expert on constitutional and human rights law, uh, all of the Myanmar ethnic opposition parties, the leaders of the 888 generation movement, all Burmese students, Democratic Front, all Arakanese student and youth congress, Rakhine state groups, and other political dissidents. He also has trained over 50 chamber and legal practitioners um, and um, um, has um, argued before the Myanmar Supreme Court at least twice in order to um, uh, try to reinstate the NLD, which had been outlawed by uh, the junta at the time. Uh, his comments will be uh, that you will hear in Myanmar, and I will be reading the translation, are made in his personal capacity. His views are expressed, um, the views that are going to be expressed are his own and do not necessarily represent the views of HRMR, the National League for Democracy, or the Myanmar government. So, yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, so, these are the Nisa Goya, and the Goya, so the ကျွန်တော်ပြေးကာစစ်ပြေးကာဆိုးရရရှိတယ်နောက်ပြောပုံကလုံးဝန်းရှင်ကိုယ်စေများကိုမင်္ဂလာပါလို့ကျွန်တ
Although it reflects the bitter truth in my country, as shown below, I wonder if you know what the, the difference is between a good lawyer in Myanmar and a great lawyer in my country. A good lawyer knows the law, while a great lawyer knows the judge. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> ကျွန်တော်တင်မြောက်နိုင်ခဲ့တာမြန်မာနိုင်ငံအတွက်နောက်ဆုံးပါတော့ကျွန်တော်အရေးကြီးပြီးတော့ကျွန်တော်ထင
it is already accepted that a federal system needs to have strong regions and stronger local governments so that governance is brought closer to its constituents. The natural resources of our land belong to all the people of Myanmar, and we do not accept that economic and social power should be limited only to the wealthiest parts of the country, as the principle of equality of opportunity must be extended to the entire nation. This is probably why a central government which ignored for too long its citizens did not have either the authority nor the power or know-how to restart the reconstruction of the entire country. <laughs> During the last 28 years, from prisons, from the illegal underground groups, or from the various organizations in exile, the NLD has consistently invoked the internationally recognized principles of self-determination and human rights as the people's response to the tyranny of the state. ကျွန်တော်တို့ကလက်စွာပူပေါင်းပါဝင်စောင်ရဲ့ခွင့်ကိုအာမခံတဲ့ကျွန်တော်နိုင်ငံရေးစီးပွားရေးယဉ်က
ปาลีมาอุบลีเนาะเปียทาอุบลีโอชีกันเนี่ยโซเชียลิอุบลีเนาะตะชั่นลุอเมยเนี่ยเจนเราท่องกว่าชิซิชิกุเนี่ยเน
Jono kagwe biri dia sihir sendiri, jono piannya di sabah pi pade. Umuman ini, jono ubi ya, pimu tenja sihir ini masih dalam ya, ni tu ko musu. Apa yang kini umai juga masuk dalam buli, pasi am itu pade. Reestablish a judicial system based on common law and under the supervision of an independent Supreme Court, which brings impartial justice without bias in open court with full defense rights to the accused. For example, presumed innocent until proven guilty. I must say, nah. Go by another corner. We keep our ability. Now, you know, so yeah, a teenager who, you know, a little bit of a car boy, and then ability who, you know, pay people she body. Now, you so yeah, yeah. Jono sejenis orang dia ada bu, jono kanda bu le, jono si bar le, na tu kui ini bu le, jono perkara tua bu si bar. Repeal laws which encroach on personal freedoms and which do not protect the public from government oppression. Limit governmental discretionary powers and eliminate special privileges. Masih cak, jono yuda jau, cak mac jau. Tiada mungkin we pejim si bar lugu juza jau, atau ini ada kuki bali, jono lu sabu si jau, we piada nai de. Enforce judicial impartiality, showing measurable implementation of honesty, integrate in integrity, and capacity for hard work without illegal payments. In too many cases, the prevailing party in litigation is the one who makes the higher payment to the judge. Specifically, the new government has to put at its core the eradication of corruption in our country. Jenaroga kiri pihak lagi balai, lada deh ni mana yang ah, kau jauh pun sih deh, lada deh, tiada ni ada deh, tiada sih ni sih ni sih bu, na matu kau yang ada, tiada ni ada, ni pasti di sana ada, jenaroga fikir di bawah ini dengan pihak mana yang suhbio, jenaroga amak kan tahu. After a quarter century of darkness, in 1988, the National League for Democracy became the first Burmese political organization to commit itself firmly to the principle of multi-party democratic system. We promise then and continue our struggle today that a free Myanmar shall be a non-discriminatory, ethnically diverse, democratic federal state with an independent and representative judiciary. <laughs> ที่ปัญหาเนี่ยอยากจะบอกว่าจะโน้มเงินเดือนบีบูรูบาร์เลยเจ็บยามีอยู่จะโน้มรวยกูจะพอสองนั่นเนี่ยอุ้งเรียน
to a moral and legal order which is diametrically opposed to oppression and exploitation. Our persistent adherence to this alternative perspective of government based on multi-party democratic and non-discriminatory values has given birth to an alternative vision for the future of Myanmar. The right of the individual to have a voice in institutions that determine his or her life through full and unqualified participation in all ethnic, of, of all, all ethnic groups, classes, and sexes in all aspects of society, and in particular in the economic area. The key to the protection of any minority, however defined, is to put first its cultural and economic rights beyond the power of the majority and to guarantee them as fundamental individual rights. ပြောတယ်ဆိုတော့ကျွန်တော်တို့ဒါကတဲ့ပါဘုတ်ပါပါတဲ့လွတ်လောက်မှုကိုတော့လည်းကလွတ်လောက်မှုပါပါတော့
in particular favor investments which will enhance export opportunities, provide substantial employment and training, technology transfer, and improve productivity while developing the comparative advantages of sourcing from Myanmar. Develop the fundamental infrastructure of the country, including transportation, generation, transport, and distribution of electric power, and the development of the latest version of the information superhighway. Substantial investment in developing a modern agricultural sector with fair settlement of land disputes guarantees of the right to land use, land maintenance, and setting up a transparent system for land rights transfer. Increasing vocational training for young people, especially in the agricultural field, and extending rural financing networks. Furthermore, improve the links between industry and agriculture in order to improve exports. Implement environmentally sensitive methods of exploration of natural resources and protecting the ecosystem through advanced planning in an open and transparent manner. Development of a, so of a sovereign wealth fund which will protect the nation's development even when natural resources run out. ဒီကာကွယ်ပဲနောက်ပြောလဲကျွန်တော်တို့ဒီကာကွယ်တဲ့စက်တင်းတဲ့ပြည်ပြည်ဆိုင်ရာစာချုပ်တွေကိုကျ
Um, we'll start with uh, the Department of State. Andrew Keller is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic and Business Affairs. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to forego uh, a more thorough introduction. So with that, Andrew, over to you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, John. It's, it's really uh, a pleasure and an honor to be part of the panel. And I'll just say um, I really appreciate your, your thoughtful approach uh, on Burma and, and our interaction with uh, the, the chamber on this issue. I think it's uh, uh, been a, a very useful partnership. So we look forward to that, to that continuing. Um, I, I think maybe a, a, a good place to pick up uh, is on uh, our guest of honors quote from Da Aung San Suu Kyi, and I can just say on behalf of, of the U.S. government, uh, uh, we very much want to take you up on that offer, uh, and, and you will find uh, a ready and willing partner to engage uh, with, with the new government and with the Burmese people. Um, in this transition uh, and as the new government takes root. Um, I can say that our top priority uh, ever since the election uh, has been to support uh, a smooth and peaceful transition and uh, to support a, a successful political and economic uh, transition and, and beginning for, for the new government. I think what I'd like to do is just give you a sense of um, our perspective uh, and, and potentially where, uh, where we stand now and how we view events in Burma, uh, and then turn it over to my colleagues from the Treasury Department and Commerce uh, and hopefully have some time for your questions. Um, I think maybe taking a step back, it's important to recognize just the monumental nature of the changes that we have seen uh, uh, over the past several months with the elections and, and the transition. Um, I think having a government, uh, uh, a democratic government for the first time in, in 50 years, um, hearing the priorities of the new government to include multi-party democratic system, respect for the rule of law, respect for human rights, um, Address, addressing issues of economic in, inequality is all extremely encouraging. Uh, if many of you are, are uh, longtime uh, Burma watchers, certainly uh, have more experience in this area than I do, I suspect that, that all of you would be surprised if five years ago uh, somebody had told you that there would be an NLD president uh, leading the new government, that Don Sung Su Chi would be in place as state counselor, um, and that, that the NLD would be um, leading this new democratic experiment. Um, I think there are very positive uh, signals that we've seen early on, including last Monday with the release of 200 uh, political prisoners and political activists. Um, this strikes me as a, as a very important development, uh, not just the release itself, but the fact that this release, of course, uh, needed to be uh, done uh, with the acquiescence of the Home Ministry, which remains under control of the military. Um, I think that's a very good sign of, of things to come as far as the uh, civilian government's ability to work with the military, which will obviously be key in, in moving forward. Um, I think overall, we find ourselves in, in the very positive situation of looking at a uh, Burma that is frankly probably more democratic uh, now than many of its neighbors, whether we're looking at Laos or Cambodia or Thailand. Um, and we certainly, uh, as I said, consider it a top priority uh, to ensure from the Uni United States government perspective that we are doing everything we possibly can uh, to support uh, the continued movement in, in this direction. Um, I had the honor, uh, uh, along with colleagues from, from OFAC, uh, of, of leading a team uh, out to meet uh, with Don Sung Suu Kyi in Rangoon, uh, excuse me, in Naypyidaw 
in, uh, in January. Um, we also met with leaders of the, uh, at that point, the, the uh, NLD economic team, uh, several of whom have now uh, assumed um, government positions. And um, we've had some opportunities uh, through our post uh, and, and here in, in Washington to gain uh, additional perspective into um, the new government and, and its priorities. Um, I think from my perspective, all of these conversations have been incredibly helpful uh, for a few reasons. First of all, they've certainly impressed upon me um, the enormity of the challenges that uh, the NLD and the new government uh, are, are facing. Um, this is certainly not a transition um, like the transitions that we are used to in the United States. This is not Democrats taking over from Republicans or Republicans taking over from Democrats. Um, this is a, a full sale transition where a party that has never been in government um, is, is uh, taking over. Um, and of course that brings uh, you know, significant challenges in, in, in a steep lear learning curve in um, figuring out the, the complexities of, of governing versus being an, an opposition party. Um, on a related note, uh, there are also complexities, obviously, with regard um, to uh, the relationship that the, uh, that the civilian government um, has with the military, and, and those are complexities that they'll need to figure out going forward. I think when we were in Rangoon in January, there was still um, uh, certain concerns that uh, perhaps there would be some military trickery or uh, efforts to undermine the transition. I think happily we can say that so far um, things are, are going very smoothly, but that's certainly a space uh, that we will keep um, our eye on. Beyond the political, um, the new government, uh, like any government, will be judged by how it delivers for its people. Um, Burma, and I, I don't need to go into detail in this crowd, but is facing significant economic challenges. And um, I think it's, uh, it's very uh, positive and uh, helpful to hear our guests' comments on, on the priorities that it will be taking, to, the new government will be taking to address some of those challenges. Um, I think sanctions uh, are obviously a key topic of interest um, and something that we are looking at very closely. I can tell you I work on sanctions issues across the board, so uh, whether it's uh, Burma, Iran, Russia, Cuba, uh, or any of our other country-based programs. And one of the things that, that we do at the State Department is try to make sure that our sanctions policies are designed and implemented in ways that support our foreign policy and national security. Um, so obviously, uh, Burma presents a lot of interesting um, and, and challenging questions uh, in light of the new developments. Um, and I can tell you again that, that our priorities um, and, and how we will be approaching the sanctions will be in line with our efforts to support the, the transition politically and economically. They will be in line with our, our goal of, of incentivizing uh, bad, for, for lack of a better term, uh, well, I, I said the military and, and cronies um, uh, to diminish their participation in, in the political and economic spheres. And of course, um, they will be uh, geared around trying to do what we can to encourage legitimate uh, uh, investment and, and economic activity in Burma. I think we have certainly heard the views of the business community here uh, and in Rangoon uh, and understand your views uh, about the sanctions. Um, I can tell you we are, we are aware that the banking sector has not um, 
uh, caught on uh, as far as, as reforms that were um, instituted in 2012. We certainly recognize that there are continued pro issues with due diligence. Uh, and, and we continue to recognize that uh, there are unintended consequences that come up in relation to our, our Burma sanctions that we, uh, we, we try to address um, as quickly as possible. GL20 uh, is the most recent and, and obvious example uh, of that. Um, I'd say also, and I think you already heard it here, so I won't belabor the point, that it's, imp it's important to keep in mind that there are issues um, beyond sanctions uh, that um, can serve and probably do serve as a drag on the economy and as a disincentive, unfortunately, to investment, whether we're talking about the rule of law or corruption. Uh, and lack of transparency or, or other issues. I think those are all things that the U.S. government uh, will be interested in uh, seeing the new government work to improve and, and that will certainly support in, in any way possible. Um, I think with that, uh, I'll just say I, I think that we are all um, interested in, uh, keenly interested in watching how things unfold on the ground and working to make sure that our policies as the U.S. government are uh, reflective of, of developments on the ground in Burma. So thank you, John. Thanks very much, Andrew. <clears throat> Let's uh, turn uh, now to uh, Samantha Saltoon from the Office of Foreign Assets Control at the Treasury Department, where uh, she is a senior sanctions advisor. Thank you, and thank you very much for your comments earlier. I would just echo um, one point in particular from Andrew's comments that we do see sanctions as a tool we can potentially use um, going forward to help support the NLD goals, some of which were very articulately laid out for us here today. Um, from Treasury's perspective, I just wanted to provide an overview of where our Burma sanctions program stands and some of the specifics as it relates to U.S. businesses looking to engage in the Burmese market. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we work very closely with our colleagues at the State Department to try to ensure that our sanctions program is calibrated to both maintain pressure on certain actors and types of behavior, but also to support our foreign policy objectives in the country. The Burma sanctions program in particular is in a very different place than some of our other sanctions programs, largely because when we see a change in behavior that we're looking for, we roll back or ease our sanctions in different ways. Our ultimate goal with all <coughs> sanctions programs, of course, is to change behavior. And Burma is an example where we see we can ease sanctions to respond to and to reinforce the positive changes on the ground in the country, particularly those we've seen over the last several months. As many of you are aware, over the last four years, the U.S. has significantly eased our broad financial, trade, and investment sanctions on Burma in response to the historic reforms that have already taken place. The remaining economic sanctions on Burma are intended primarily to discourage economic activity with certain individuals and entities. I just want to highlight the three specific areas that remain of concern to the U.S. government. They include those who undermine or obstruct political reform in Burma, those who commit human rights abuses in Burma, and those who propagate military trade with North Korea. Following Burma's peaceful and competitive elections last fall, we continue to review our sanctions policy to gauge ways that we can support the democratically elected, civilian-led government in deepening and consolidating the democratic transition by supporting further political reforms, including constitutional reform, as was mentioned earlier, and broad-based economic growth. Even as we maintain pressure on individuals and entities that resist or hinder reform, our targeted sanctions are intended to support Burma's inclusive economic development. So I'm just going to provide a quick overview of where our sanctions currently stand, and if there are specific questions that I'm not addressing, I look forward to hearing them afterwards. Um, largely speaking, as a result of the general licenses or the blanket authorizations that OFAC has issued, primarily commencing in 2012, but also GL20 that Andrew mentioned last December, there are very few remaining economic sanctions on Burma, namely restrictions on dealing with persons on the specially designated nationals and black persons list, or the SDN list restrictions on the importation into the United States of jadeite and rubies and any jewelry containing them from Burma, and restrictions on dealings with the Burmese Ministry of Defense or state or non-state armed groups. Broadly speaking, 
the U.S. has opened the door for U.S. businesses to trade and invest in Burma. We've issued a series of general licenses and also rolled back other changes, other sanctions, restrictions to allow for various ways for U.S. businesses to take advantage of these authorizations. And I know that there are a handful of U.S. businesses that have over the past few years. To help support U.S. companies that are already engaged in the Burmese market or that are considering going in, in December of last year, we issued General License 20. GL 20 authorized for six months certain trade-related transactions otherwise prohibited by the Burmese sanctions regulations. What's important to note is that the general license authorizes individuals, companies, financial institutions, everybody involved in trade and trade-associated transactions um, to facilitate the trade, to engage in the transactions, um, as long as it's um, incident to the export to or from Burma of goods, technology, or non-financial services. So examples of the types of transactions that would fall under this general license would include, for example, trade finance transactions, paying, paying for port fees, shipping and handling charges, um, and a host of others. Just to clarify also that GL20 does not authorize exports to, for, or on behalf of an SDN or anybody who has property that's owned 50% or more by an SCN. The general license also does not authorize a U.S. financial institution to advise or confirm any financing by SDNs or other black persons. GL20 is very much intended to support U.S. and Burmese exporters and to facilitate trade with Burma. More specifically, the general license is another effort by the U.S. government to calibrate the impact of our Burma sanctions and to support the ongoing flow of trade with Burma supporting Burma's economic development, including the encouragement of normal trade with non-sanctioned business in Burma is a key foreign policy objective. And we look forward to hearing feedback from the business community regarding other possible ways that we can help support this type of engagement. Um, I would just echo one other point that Andrew had raised. We understand that there are other challenges more broadly in Burma that are not sanction specific. Uh, we've been hearing that from businesses and banks as well. Um, from our part, at least the Treasury's part, we're happy to do whatever we can um, that's, you know, within the foreign, U.S. foreign policy interest um, and also are, are sympathetic to the other challenges that are going on. Um, with that, I would just turn it over to my Commerce Park colleague. Thank Thanks you. very much, Samantha. Um, we'll now hear from Holly Vineyard, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Commerce Department and uh, a longtime Asia hand. Uh, Holly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John, for the organization of this event today. Thank you to all of you in the audience for coming. It's so exciting to see so many people who are passionate about the future of this partnership. And um, I want to especially thank Wu Jiaho uh, for traveling so far uh, to, to be with us. Uh, this is really uh, quite an exciting event to have at this time. I apologize for being a few minutes late. I was with Secretary Pritzker while she was giving remarks over at the National Press Club, and she touched on something that is actually important for this audience, so I thought I would share that. Um, she was talking about the importance of commercial diplomacy. Uh, she has found now in uh, her time as Secretary of Commerce that in traveling to 40-some countries that she's not gone anywhere where she's seen a government that has not been receptive of having more U.S. company engagement in those countries. But Sometimes the conditions aren't always right uh, for those companies. So she's found it uh, most effective when she travels with business leaders so that they can together meet with government leaders in a host country to talk about um, how they can grow their own economy, how they can develop jobs for their own people, and how at the same time they can also create more opportunities for U.S. companies uh, by making certain kinds of reforms. And so she's been very interested in engaging in those conversations and working with our partners uh, as they try to reform to help themselves and also in a way that uh, ends up helping our companies to be able to engage more deeply in those markets. And I say that in the context of I had the opportunity to travel with her to, to your country um, in June 2014. And it was an exciting time uh, when she was able to meet with Da Aung San Suu Kyi and with other leaders to have exactly those kinds of conversations. And I think it's important that we continue those kinds of conversations. As a sort of a legacy or 
souvenir from her visit, she announced the opening of our commercial service office there um, in, uh, at our embassy in Rangoon. And I'm pleased to say that our office there is now up and running and we're uh, very happy to be working with an increased number of U.S. companies that are looking at that market. And so I wanted to make sure that you are all aware of, of, of that opportunity. And I'll come to, uh, back to talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, uh, I did want to um, tell you a little bit about the Commerce Department overall first, um, about the International Trade Administration. Uh, where it's our job to promote trade and investment to help U.S. companies uh, compete abroad and attract foreign direct investment into the United States. And we like to say our clients are those who create U.S. jobs through trade and investment. And the nice aspect of this is that uh, our clients also often end up creating jobs in the host countries too. Uh, but our, our mission is really to create more U.S. jobs because after all it is uh, the U.S. taxpayers who, who pay our salaries. Uh, and uh, to help our clients, we have a network of staff that's located in Washington, D.C. Anne is our, our Burma desk officer. Um, we have people uh, located throughout the United States in our U.S. Export Assistance Centers. So we like to say we touch every zip code in the U.S. And then we are, are in about 80 countries overseas, and one of our newest uh, countries that we're in is, is Burma. And so we like to say that we house our, the experts on and in the markets that our companies want to go to. So that's a little bit about our structure. You know, we work alongside our, our colleagues um, from the State Department overseas and sometimes uh, colleagues from Treasury in certain um, uh, countries, and certainly working closely with both uh, bureaucracies here in Washington. So we try to help U.S. companies understand and navigate uh, the various opportunities, no matter what the size of the company or the products and services they're exporting. And I want to underscore that about the size because a lot of there's a misconception, I think, sometimes that we're only there to help big business. Actually, our bread and butter, as we like to say, are helping the smaller companies. Often the big companies, they, they know where to find us. They already know what the resources are. But uh, where uh, we find that we make a, a, a lot of impact is helping the small companies. So we're very excited about um, the growth um, in the region overall. The Secretary was talking about the importance of the rebalance to Asia. Uh, we're very excited about the opportunities for working uh, with ASEAN, and we're very excited about working with Burma. One area that we found there to be a lot of interest in, in, in lately is in talking about standards. Uh, the standards, uh, some people say technical barriers to trade or standards keeps them, puts them to sleep. I say it keeps me up awake at night because as the secretary just put it in her remarks over at the National Press Club, they laid the foundation for future business. And so, especially since um, we're talking about our, the importance of helping small companies, larger companies can often manufacture to any standard. Smaller companies cannot. So the more you have a common understanding or a common approach to standards, uh, the more you can do to help many people uh, for years to come. The more we can work with ASEAN on standards issues and uh, countries like Burma on standards issues really does lay a strong foundation. And so we've really enjoyed that uh, interaction with ASEAN as a whole and uh, working with Burma in particular. Our office out in Rangoon is helping to produce what we call our annual country commercial guide. And we do that for about every market that we're in. And those can be found on our website, export.gov. And so for any of you who are looking at Burma, uh, I would consider this to be a, a must read. Uh, it contains research that, focus on, that focuses on particular sectors that we think are uh, especially good prospects um, for U.S. companies. That doesn't mean to say that if you don't see your sector there, you shouldn't feel like you're, uh, there's not an opportunity for you. Because we think that right now, in particular, is a great time to be taking a look uh, at Burma, and we'd like to help you do that. I mentioned our new office um, in, uh, in Rangoon, and I should note that for the first two quarters of this fiscal year, our office there has already counseled or assisted 200 companies and is also supporting different uh, Burmese delegations traveling to the U.S. And so all these, I think, have the potential for creating uh, even more opportunities. We've been very pleased to see the uh, American Chamber of Commerce's presence in Burma growing. Uh, the secretary had a chance to talk to the AmCham when she was out there, uh, and I don't think it had anywhere near close to the 130 member companies um, that it does now. And we think that uh, it, it's wonderful to see that so many of those are U.S. companies, and even nicer, let's welcome some of those here today. One 
one other tool for engaging with Burma is by working with the Asia Devel the Asian Development Bank. I should note that we also have a senior commercial officer there posted in Manila at the bank. Uh, and the bank is very bullish on Burma, forecasting its GDP growth to be 8.4% um, this year, making it the fastest growing economy um, in, um, in Southeast Asia in their Asia development outlook. And so you can work with us directly. You can work with us through the Asian Development Bank. Uh, but um, the thing is we, we really want you to be taking a look now. We just would like to help um, you take uh, a look at the market with your eyes wide open. Because making the reforms is not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. But if you wait for a perfect market, you're going to be facing perfect competition. And so I think it's a really good time to engage. And we're, we're very eager to support you and support this overall partnership. So in closing, I just wanted to wish you all a happy Burmese New Year. Uh, I think this event seems like a great way to start uh, the year. And uh, really, again, thank you to all of you for being here today. Thanks very much, Holly. We're running a couple minutes behind, but I do want to try to sneak in a couple of questions here if we can. We've gotten some over the net. And um, I'm sure that there's a couple uh, from those in the audience here. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Uh, over on this side, Alexa. Uh, and please uh, introduce yourself and keep your question concise, please. Thank you. Uh, David Steinberg, Georgetown Emeritus and SICE. A comment and a question. You mentioned the opening of a trade office in Yangon. About two weeks after you opened the trade office, the president said, the actions and policies of the government of Burma continue to pose an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. How does that sit with the Burmese? We understand the bureaucracy here in the United States. How do the Burmese react? Secondly, I'd like to ask Hu Ho. Will Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD ask the U.S. to give up the sanctions that remain in the interest of delivering services that she wants to deliver, and in the interest of uh, helping trust develop between the NLD and the military. You want to yeah, tackle the first question first? Sure. Th thank you for the question. Um, it, it, it's a good one and, and, and not a surprising one. And, you know, I, Clearly, the, uh, the language that, that you cited comes from uh, IEPA, which is the, the framework statute for sanctions. And Samantha can, can speak to you uh, more broadly about the, the, the technical aspects of what's required for the United States to have a sanctions program in place. Um, and, and one of those requirements is the national emergency language you read. I, I think it's fair to say that um, at this point, uh, and, and why don't I not beat around the bush? I think everybody uh, knows um, that there is a requirement uh, if we are to keep our sanctions framework in place for there to be a renewal of the national emergency by May. Um, I can tell you, uh, as, as you well know, I am not the President of the United States. Um, and, and renewal of the national emergency is a presidential decision, so I certainly cannot make uh, any announcement. Um, but what I can tell you is that uh, in, in a good way, um, given the elections, given the transition, we are now able to be in a position where we are discussing United States sanctions directly with the government of Burma and, and working with them to ensure that what we are doing on the sanctions and on other fronts uh, is uh, supportive of, of their efforts on the political and economic side. Um, so, so I think it's fair to say that we have shared goals uh, in this area at, at this point. And um, frankly, as you know, there are a lot of other stakeholders uh, in Burma and, and in the United States with, with regard to these policies. Um, so we are, we are taking input uh, from everyone as we uh, work to, to align our policy uh, with developments on the ground. And, and, you know, John referenced input from the chamber, which is, which is uh, certainly a very helpful data point and something we've been looking at closely. So thank you. 
Second question. Jo sanjeun na pat de yo. Jo no di anani ba di ne jo do dong su do san su ji ye jo no ani tbo da do. Ta na pat de yo jo no ba di dwe ma le jo no pyo su po mun ne ne pyo su su ni da le mi si ba. Su ni pyo su da le mi si. Di ga do di sanjeun na pat de yo di jo ta yao mu na pat de yo ta le be jo no di ตัวเจมส์ตัวเจมส์ตัวบอร์ดอาเบชิจาบาร์พอดีพอดีทุกคนนี่เนี่ยที่ซีเวอร์ซงเวจเนี่ยชาบิโอชามันเนี่ยบ
ဟုတ်ကြီးကျွန်တော်ဒီဥပေစာရာပြုပြင်ပြောင်းလဲမှုပါတော့ကျွန်တော်တရားဥပေစိုးဝေးရေးပြန်လက်တည်ဆောက်
and thank you to the Chamber for this opportunity to share our thoughts with you this afternoon. As the first U.S. energy company to sign a contract in Myanmar since the easing of the economic sanctions in 2012, APR Energy is well aware of the opportunities for investment in Myanmar. Less than three years ago, APR Energy was contracted by Myanmar Electric Power Enterprise to install and operate a large-scale turnkey power plant in Chakse, which is approximately 60 miles from Mandalay in the central part of Myanmar. Our initial contract in early 2014 called for 82 megawatts of electric generating capacity using our modular containerized generator sets powered by clean burning domestic natural gas. We were closely with the State Utility and the Ministry of Energy to ensure the installation and commissioning of our power plan were completed less than 90 days after the contract was signed. Less than a year later, we were contracted to install an additional 20 megawatts to provide supplemental power in advance of the dry season, which would adversely impact the region's hydropower production. Today, APR Energy is proud to provide the Mandalay region of Myanmar with essential electricity for more than six million people, enhancing the quality of life, spurring economic development, and helping to grow the nation's economy. This project has been very fulfilling for APR Energy in many ways. Certainly, we are proud that this project and our close collaboration with the Myanmar Electric Power Enterprise and the Ministry of Energy has been recognized in our industry. A prime example was that the Chakse project was named by Power Magazine as a Top Plants 2015 award winner. We're also extremely proud of the impact this project is having on the Chaukse community. With all of, as with all of our project, uh, power generation projects, APR Energy brings a commitment to providing lasting positive impact in the communities where we operate. In Chaukse, we were able to hire and train locally nearly 70% of our workforce to operate and maintain the power plant. In addition to providing meaningful jobs, our commitment to hiring and training local residents means that important skills remain in the community long after our temporary power plant ends. We also take great pride in the effort of our local energy team to rehabilitate three schools in 2014. Support included construction and structural improvements, as well as provision of teaching aids, classroom furniture, and student supplies. These activities help relieve overcrowded classrooms and support 400 children with improved and expanded educational facilities. So how did all this come about? At APR Energy, providing fast track power is our core business. Since the company was founded in 2004, we have installed more than three gigawatts of generating capacity in more than 30 countries on five continents. That's 3,000 megawatts. Much of our focus is on providing electricity to developing nations and chronically underserved markets. It is our steadfast belief that access to reliable electricity is an essential building block for economic growth, job creation, and an improved quality of life. Yet we know many parts of the world access to reliable power is taken for granted. We find it shocking that 1.3 billion people around the world lack electricity and the ability to enjoy basic necessities. So why did we go to Myanmar? Myanmar is an emerging market economy with a tremendous economic potential and great regional significance. For APR Energy, the attraction was a, the crucial need for adequate electricity supplies and our corporate philosophy that economies can grow in the dark. At the, time we initiated, at the time we initiated our business development efforts in Myanmar, three quarters of the population lacked electricity. While we had much to learn about Myanmar, we were aware that the country is blessed with significant natural gas reserves. With our technology, we were convinced that we could help Myanmar monetize its indigenous natural gas and provide reliable electricity at the same time. 
We also were attracted to Myanmar because after years of isolation, U.S. companies like ours were now permitted to do business in Myanmar. In early 2013, we started visiting Yangon and Naypyidaw. We conducted our own market assessment, and we collected and checked data from various sources on existing power facilities in the country. Some of the biggest challenges we faced were identifying the decision makers in the power sector and understanding the government's evolving procurement process. We responded by raising awareness among the relevant officials regarding our solutions and how they could positively, positively impact the country. This dialogue was not easy to initiate and it required months of patience and persistence. But as we know today, it was worthwhile and the persistence and relationship building has paid off. Our Myanmar project has been one of the most fulfilling and important in our company's history. As mentioned earlier, APR Energy has installed power plants in more than 30 countries around the world. Each country and each project has presented unique challenges. Myanmar, however, has been different. In the words of our head of business development in Asia Pacific, Chokse project was a breath of fresh air. Throughout the initial contract, the 20 megawatt expansion and a one-year extension that was announced last year, the Myanmar government has been extremely cooperative and helpful. They've been keenly interested in creating a solution that would demonstrate the value of foreign investment and economic growth to the people of Myanmar. And APR Energy is proud that our project is helping to achieve that goal. So what are the future plans? In keeping with the theme of this webcast, investment in Myanmar, a new era, we're optimistic and enthusiastic about future opportunities for electricity projects in the country. Given the interim nature of our project, we cannot predict how long Myanmar will continue to need our current plant in Chaukse. But that being said, we plan to operate the plant as long as it is needed, as long as the government sees value, and we will continue to look for opportunities to enhance the quality of life in other parts of the country. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Uh, as we did with the first panel, we'll hold all the questions and comments until all the speakers have gone. Um, and I will next uh, ask my friend Vincent Wong, uh, representing the Myanmar U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He's come down from New York for this event. Good Thank to you. see you again. Thank you. Thank you, John, for inviting us to the United States Chamber of Commerce. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eric Rose, uh, in the panel. And uh, welcome, Ujo Ho, to um, uh, Washington, D.C. And we really thank you. And um, it was an honor to speak uh, here on the panel this afternoon. Um, just by way of background, uh, we, as the organization based in New York, uh, that was a sister, that is a sister organization of the Nima uh, Chinese American organization that was formed 40 years ago with uh, perhaps thousands of members now, but only a few hundred active members. We are, we feel that one of the few organizations uh, on the front lines um, that's helping small and medium sized enterprises to take advantage of what Myanmar has uh, to offer currently, what Myanmar is going to offer in the future. Um, just some of the issues that we saw the last few years. Um, in 2012, uh, as the country was opening up, uh, we are all serving on a pro bono capacity in our organization because we are all uh, somehow uh, affiliated with our country in one way or another. Most of us uh, were born in Myanmar. So uh, most of our members that are going back to Myanmar to invest today, um, they are active, they are aggressive, they are, go they are, they are outgoing. Uh, we have industries from real estate, um, services, um, goods, products, um, but they face challenges um, aside from the sheer distance from the United States to Myanmar. Uh, uh, but the opportunities are there. Uh, most of our members and uh, the people that we support, they know uh, what Myanmar has to offer is really unparalleled and uh, probably one of the, less, the last emerging countries uh, with that market. Um, there's a young, strong, eager, determined, motivated labor force there that's willing to learn. Um, Aside from the legal issues and the accounting issues and due diligence, um, 
the, the market is there. Uh, we have members that are doing business on the ground now um, in various industries and markets. And as an organization, a pro bono organization, uh, we offer them uh, the information that we have. Um, for, for instance, as today, we learned a lot of information from the uh, Department of Commerce um, where they support the small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, we're going to offer that and share that with our members and anyone who uh, seek the information from us. Um, the banking uh, problem still is an issue, as some of the prior panels talked about, um, whether the, the funds needed to invest in MIMA or some of the funds that are coming out uh, in the form of the uh, revenue. Um, but it's, it's a challenge. But one thing is for sure, uh, we fully support sanctions have to end uh, for the U.S. side to invest in Myanmar because it's such a great challenge to find the right partners there and have the U.S. government um, clear these partners and the uh, existing issues. I mean, we offer the access to the markets, the capital. Um, outside of Myanmar, some of the Myanmar companies also seek our organization's um, advice and contacts, and uh, it's, it's, it's complex um, for the Myanmar-based entities to do business uh, where they want to take advantage of the U.S. market. But our organization stand um, in New York, and we have contacts uh, out on the West Coast, and we always help them with the information that um, they, they need and seek, and uh, we're there to help them. But we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of exciting opportunities. There are new markets, uh, a couple of that with the technology, because they skipped a few decades. You know, they went from uh, version zero to the current version, so they skipped all the, uh, uh, the, the, the middle ground. So it's an exciting time, especially for me, because I think uh, as a young boy uh, living in the United States for the last 38 years, to be able to see with my own eyes um, some of the law firms and accounting firms that I used to work for having an office in Myanmar now is a great opportunity. And for that, we thank everyone who was involved uh, that is pushing the Myanmar agenda from the United States side. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, next, we'll turn to JJ Ong, the Manager for International Government Affairs with Chevron. JJ. Thanks, John. Appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, it's a privilege to be with uh, the panelists here to, to talk about kind of the doing business aspect of, of Myanmar. And uh, first, I want to also commend you, John, and the Chamber's efforts in, in the work on Myanmar. I know it's, it's, a, it's a hard slog sometimes, but we appreciate the effort on, on the U.S. businesses. Um, so uh, for Chevron, uh, for the past 20 years, we've been um, a president in Myanmar. Uh, locally, we're known as Unical, a Myanmar offshore company, and um, we've it's been our privilege to partner with the country of Myanmar to spur economic growth and development. Um, our primary um, interest there in terms of um, the natural gas sector is a non-operated investment in offshore field, um, as well as then um, a associated pipeline with that project. Um, as well, in 2014, uh, Unical was uh, granted a PSC um, production sharing contract and signed one last year for uh, exploration of an offshore block um, off southern Rakhine State. Um, and that's been uh, moving forward as well. Um, uh, in addition to the, our, our business operations, uh, we've also had a very uh, significant operations in terms of working with the people and their uh, what we call social investment and corporate social responsibility. and. Um, and as Eric alluded to in, in what APR does, um, this is a very important aspect as well for companies like us and for many American companies that are operating there. Um, in terms of um, some of the, the challenges of, of doing business in Myanmar, um, you know, th these, are, these are well documented and, and other, other groups like the Chamber and others have, have really done really great, great work to talk with uh, U.S. companies about, about those challenges. Um, for us, um, just the, the, what we call the added due diligence of having to uh, vet partners and services and, and all those uh, aspects when it comes to just do, the normal course of doing business in Myanmar um, presents um, challenges. Um, really, it's just added time and added cost. And any time you increase time and increase cost to get the most basic functions done, it's just um, incredibly inefficient 
um, and, and very difficult. So, um, and that's in 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 regards to um, you know the compliance with the U.S. SDN list um, and and other things related to ensuring that um, um, we comply with all U.S. regulations. Um, in terms of um, oppor opportunities looking ahead, um, I think. Um, uh, the first panelist, uh, the first panel uh, with Yu Jiaho and what he's talking about in terms of rule of law and, and really capacity building, I think that's, that represents significant opportunities for both the U.S. government as well as, I think, um, in, in the right, uh, right uh, appropriate um, chances for U.S. companies to possibly partner and help um, um, as appropriate um, capacity building and developing um, what we call the right software um, so that companies like ours, companies like APR Energy and others can um, operate in an environment that um, where the rule of law is certain and contract sanctity is preserved um, and uh, these type of um, software type issues are, are um, well developed um, so that companies can have um, certainty when they, when they come and, and invest. Um, as well, working with um, uh, the Myanmar government um, agencies as appropriate to help in their capacity building efforts. It's, it's, it's obvious the challenges uh, ahead for the new government. And so uh, I think uh, with the U.S. government, I think possibly leading the way to, to help uh, increase the capacities of, of government bureaucrats in order to ensure that um, those software type issues are, are built. So um, I, I think I'll just leave it there and, and uh, thank you for, again for the opportunity and look forward to your questions. Okay, thanks JJ. And uh, now I'll turn it over to uh, Peter Kuchik uh, with the Inley Advisory Group and uh, formerly of the Treasury Department's uh, Office of Foreign Assets Control. Peter. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you to the Chamber and to my fellow panelists and for uh, Yu Cha Ho for, for joining us from Myanmar today. Um, first, uh, as John noted, I, I am uh, formerly with OFAC uh, and have been in the private sector now um, trying to advise businesses for the last two years. So I hope I can offer uh, a little bit of an interesting perspective uh, into some of what my former government colleagues offered today. Um, first and foremost, I, I'd like to say that um, as everybody has uh, expressly stated and alluded to today, there's another round of great excitement about the opportunities in Myanmar since the election in November and even more specifically since the seating of the new NLD government the last couple of weeks. Um, I think that we, this is a, a very compelling time to be re-engaging, to be uh, having these types of events and discussing the opportunities there because they are they are great. Um, as also has been alluded to, there is still a number of difficulties in dealing with, with Myanmar and one of the main ones remains uncertainty and confusion around the U.S. sanctions regime. Um, over the course of my experience in the private sector, that has been a constant theme. I think that there is uh, still notwithstanding, I think, what are some very positive efforts by the U.S. government to explain and make clear what is expected. Uh, it hasn't translated at least sufficiently for, uh, for this to be working, I think, as well as it could. Um, I think that my, uh, my, my friend and former colleague, Samantha, correctly reflected that the majority of these changes, these, uh, the easing of the, the, the broad sanctions, the financial uh, restriction on financial transactions and the restrictions on new investment, occurred essentially in 2012 and 2013, which means that we have now gone quite some distance from there and we are still experiencing some difficulties that frankly were being experienced even then. So I think that the time has come for things to, uh, to change. Um, I think another thing that has been correctly noted is that the U.S. sanctions are having a, a, a very uh, profound impact in the financial service sector. Um, and I think that what wasn't yet said yet is that those, those impacts, in fact, go beyond U.S. companies. I think people have a tendency to think about the impact of U.S. sanctions being mainly focused on U.S. business. But it goes broader than that. Every multinational financial institution in the world pays attention and largely adheres to U.S. requirements for, for sanctions, which means that 
uh, difficulties like the, uh, the port terminal in Yangon last summer have far broader impact than just preventing U.S. trade. Um, certainly, the, the, my former colleagues took, uh, took uh, a, a, an effort to address that. But my point is that the, the effect when it was being felt was being felt by banks in Japan, by banks in Singapore, as well as banks, U.S. banks. Um, so um, for what it's worth, uh, I, I think that it's also, it's also very much true that this increases due diligence costs. Uh, and I think that um, what my goal is, given the amount of excitement, given the, uh, given the sort of renewed interest in, in learning about the opportunities in Myanmar is to, uh, to hold my, uh, my former colleagues to what uh, they, they referred to today, to take them up on their offer, to help support the continued reform uh, and the economic development in Myanmar by advocating and promoting U.S. business. Um, U.S. business has a lot to offer, as my colleagues here have just mentioned, in terms of CSR, in terms of training, in terms of capacity building. And uh, I think it's incumbent on the, uh, the U.S. government to do everything it can at this point to help make that happen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Okay, why don't we uh, again open it up to the next round of questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the mic. And uh, identify yourself, please. Hello, I'm a second year MA student at Johns Hopkins Science. Um, I just wonder, uh, because Japan has been using its official uh, development aid to bring the private sector into the picture and to create better uh, investment uh, environment for the private sector, uh, especially Japanese firms, I just wonder if you have any expectations of um, the collaboration between USAID and the uh, American private sector on the ground. Thank you. Um, as you know, unlike Japan, the U.S. has multiple voices. So we have all kinds of acronyms, um, USAID, OPIC, Exim Bank, all of which are, uh, or each of which is, is having its own programs. Example, Exim Bank doesn't do onshore financing, except if it receives uh, uh, government guarantees, which Myanmar is not capable of giving. So all of its financing or programs or insurance for um, uh, sales into Myanmar have to be guaranteed by a subsidiary outside of Myanmar. OPIC, on the other hand, does do onshore, and OPIC has actually uh, worked on, for example, the Apollo Towers, uh, the cell phone towers, uh, and helping TPG, uh, Texas Pacific Group, which is the largest investment that's been made in Myanmar, um, as well as in a distillery uh, for about $100 million. It's the only one. Um, the uh, USAID is primarily dealing with, uh, with NGOs. Not, not with for-profit corporations, because most of it are, are in democracy, in, in capacity building programs. Um, and the program is, I mean, the, the programs of USAID are quite substantial. I think they're over a quarter billion dollars. So um, we, unlike Japan, we don't speak with one voice. We don't have one source of, uh, of uh, resources that, that are uh, available for uh, uh, American business. The, Commerce Department is one place that, that one can go and try to corral some of this together, but even there, they don't have all the information. You have to st still, it's like herding cats in many respects. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Eric. Just, can I add something, please? Yeah, please. I, I think um, in the early 90s, I had the opportunity to work with USAID, and I think if Japan um, invest in Myanmar, and they do, um, and I think Uch, uh, uh, Ucho Ho mentioned a sovereign fund. I think there's an opportunity there for USAID, I believe, and I have, uh, our organization have contacted USAID um, to see whether there's an opportunity for an enterprise funds 
um, very similar to a private equity fund uh, working hand in hand with perhaps a sovereign fund of a country. Um, in the early 90s, um, the USAID did help um, many other European countries with enterprise funds. I just want to just throw it out there. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd actually, uh, we had a question come in over the internet that I didn't get the opportunity to ask earlier, but I think this is best directed at Uchaho. Um, and the question relates to the point that you made about increasing agricultural uh, exports. And um, the question is, what role do you see the private sector playing in boosting agricultural trade? And uh, given that um, investment law limits foreign companies from having majority stakes in uh, importing and exporting operations, um, how do you see, um, well, that, obviously that impacts their ability to come into the country. So what is, what do you see as the way forward to increase foreign involvement in the agricultural trade sector? ကျွန်တော်မှာမှန်မှန်မှာတော့ဥပ္ပဒ္ဓဘောလီဟိုစိုက်ပူးရတော့အဓိကအချိန်ကအဓိကကျတာဘောလီခုနဲ့ဘော
Uh, thanks, John. Uh, David Mortlock, I'm with the law firm of Wilkie Farr, uh, also a former colleague of Peter's. Uh, so my question is, obviously, we heard in the earlier panel that um, the president has a decision to make very soon, uh, in about three weeks or so, on the uh, renewal of the national emergency. Uh, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that he does renew the national emergency um, and the, the framework of the sanctions remains in place. Uh, based on uh, patterns in these kind of situations in the past, I think it's quite likely that uh, the government at the same time will take a number of actions to demonstrate, obviously, the continued progress on reform uh, in Myanmar and particularly in light of the election. So uh, let me, if I can put uh, Vincent Peter on the spot just for a second. You know, Vincent, um, what should the government do if it's not going to lift the national emergency? to help uh, continue encouraging reform and US participation in, in Myanmar. And Peter, just uh, if you were to speculate wildly, what do you think the government will do? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think that's a very good question. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I was so happy that some of the presidential candidates did talk about Myanmar. You know, the subject came up, and I think um, two that I counted anyway, the recent uh, past few weeks, debates I was watching. Uh, we don't know what the president is going to do, more likely this way or the other way. I think the last two, three years of this administration have taken active um, interest in Myanmar, and it really helped a lot. I think our president uh, visiting Myanmar really stood out um, and made the Myanmar, the country as a whole, uh, see the hope, you know, Hope, H O P E. I think what Peter said is so true. CSR and capacity building and training and technical support and um, sanctions is a big topic. You know, trading restrictions, as Mr. Rose pointed out, um, the United States government have many, many um, people that are in charge. So, uh, what should the government do? I hope that the next administration that's coming in and this current administration take an active interest in the country and continue what they have done the last uh, a few years since 2012. Um, thank you. Sure. Um, just to make one quick comment, and then Eric, and then Peter. Um, um, one thing that uh, the chamber and, and others in the business community have been advocating for is the uh, extension or the resumption of GSP privileges for uh, Myanmar. U.S. imports from Myanmar last year were on the order of $150 million. In the total U.S. trade picture, that's not even a rounding error, but that's actually fairly significant, I think, in, uh, in Myanmar terms, and GSP would allow the opportunity for Myanmar uh, entrepreneurs and business people to sell to customers in the United States. So thanks, David. Uh, I think that uh, I think there's a couple of, uh, of things that I think are not only possible, I think are, are hopefully likely. Um, first of all, I think that I would hope that the uh, General License 20 for trade is extended uh, quickly before the deadline to give uh, to give those who are exporting and, and importing uh, to and from Myanmar have some certainty that that, that has been renewed. Um, and I, I think I would add to that that uh, you know it would be helpful if it were uh, extended without a, uh, a new expiration date to give people certainty moving forward. Um, the next point I think that you heard uh, uh, Das Keller refer to is the, the difficulties that that the U.S. government is very well aware of on the financial sector uh, and banking and the fact that it, quote, hasn't caught up yet with some of the changes that were implemented way back in 2012. Um, my hope, and uh, I guess I'll leave it there, my hope would be that the, the U.S. government would take some actions and, and undertake some initiatives to streamline financial transactions and to help get that sector where it, it ought to be, uh, certainly in line with the 2012 reforms, but you know potentially broader than that, to help supporting U.S. businesses who, of course, are looking um, ideally towards U.S. banks for support in Myanmar, and that certainly has not yet materialized. 
Right. Well, thank you all for coming out here. Uchaho, thank you very much. Uh, to my fellow panelists, thank you for your participation and to the audience, uh, both here and uh, here virtually. Thank you for participating.